Well, tomorrow the government will launch their plans for next year's 1916 centenary commemoration. It's a commemoration that all political parties are clamouring to take ownership of. But just how should we remember those who died on both sides of what was a bloody but seminal conflict in the formation of the state? Here's what former Taoiseach John Bruton thinks. Obviously, a central part of any commemoration of the 1916 Rising has to be remembering the sacrifice and the bravery of those who were buried here in Arbor Hill, who initiated the Rising, and those who followed them. But how can we now best commemorate 100 years later what happened then without either glorifying violence or reopening old wounds? I would suggest that the best way to do that is to ensure that explicitly and by name we commemorate everyone who died in Dublin at that time. Whether they were on the side of those commemorated here in Arbor Hill, on the other side or on no side at all. Here behind me at the gates of Dublin Castle on the 24th of April 1916, Constable James O'Brien of the unarmed Dublin Metropolitan Police was shot dead. He was shot exactly at this spot here, just at, at the gate. When the gates would have been opened, as I've seen two parts, and when he saw the group coming up, he thought it was a parade, and they came up uh, Cork Hill, five or six of them, and they came just at close proximity. He went to push his way in, and uh, James O'Brien put his hand straight across him like that, and Sean Connolly took out his revolver and shot him straight in the face. He'd have known that he was unarmed because all he would have been carrying as a baton at the time. He was from Kilfergus in County Limerick. He had 21 year service uh, completed in the Dublin Metropolitan Police. He's 48 years of age and he left a widow and three children. These were people uh, of Ireland. Oh, oh, who Irish lost their people lives at, the, here. at the end of the day. When we come to commemorate 1916, there should be no hierarchy of victims and we should remember all the victims and that's exactly what happens here in this small graveyard at the back of Dr Stevens Hospital where on one side we have the grave of two members of the Irish volunteers who died and on the other the grave of five members of the British Army who died in 1916 of whom three are most certainly Irish. They are reconciled together here in death and they're remembered together here in death. So there should be no hierarchy of victims, says John Bruton, and we'll chat more to John and the rest of our panel in just a moment. But Trevor Hogan is here with us. Trevor, you're an historian. What do you think should happen? Should we commemorate everybody who was involved? Um, I think it's, it's admirable, the, the aim to not have a hierarchy. And I think if you look at how, especially World War I, uh, has been commemorated in recent years, you don't want a similar situation emerging whereby just combatants and victims in that war were just commemorated and then you didn't recognise the pacifists and conscientious objectors so at home So everybody should who be remembered equally heart. is what you're saying. Do you agree no, with John Bruce? No, I think Bruce? there should be a distinction probably made and a differentiation made between those who stood up against oppression and who, who in, in the brilliant words of the proclamation, envisaged a society of equals, a just social society. We should recognise their actions in life and mark and distinguish between those people who stood up against oppression and the, the people who chose to enforce oppression on the other side. And uh, in between, unfortunately, you have innocent civilians who should be recognised. So um, recognise the civilians, recognise the rebels, but don't recognise those well, people who tried yes. to suppress them. But I think we pr put on a little bit of a pedestal, the people, and in terms of what should be the centre of it, the centre of the commemoration should be the proclamation. And unfortunately, from what I can gather, the government, who were embarrassed almost by 1916, still haven't released any programme, and they're still putting it off to the last well, second. Well, and they're, they're have chosen to do that tomorrow, and we'll, we'll find yeah, out we more about that in just a moment. We can talk about that. But uh, could I just make this point that uh, quickly, yeah. the, at the centrepiece of the key day and how we should commemorate it is, is Easter Sunday or Monday, whichever day it's going to be. But it shouldn't be about a military parade and an Air Corps flyover whereby people look to the sky and the ordinary people, which is what the proclamation is about, are on the sidelines and looking on. 
And it should be instead, instead the people should take part in the parade. Okay. People should take part in a mass mobilisation. And we only have to look whether you agree with it or not at the water charge protests and how mobilised and energetic those were and how people took took ownership of the society. So you want, you want to see people taking ownership I want to see a mass demonstration and okay. not about the politicians Neil, and the Neil elites. Neil Richardson is beside you. Neil, you're also an historian. Do you think that everybody should be commemorated and there shouldn't be a hierarchy of victims? I'm not sure about the idea that there shouldn't be a hierarchy of victims. I mean, I understand that there were more civilians killed in, in Easter week uh, and more civilians wounded than all of the rebel fatalities and British Army fatalities combined. So the big losers were always going to be the civilians, no more than in any war. Um, my area of interest is the Irish soldiers that actually served with the British Army in Dublin during Easter week. And they represent 35% of the British Army fatalities and 29% of the wounded. So. In actual fact, the first responders, the first British Army troops to respond to the insurgency they were, were Irish, Irishmen. you're saying. Um, many of them former members of the Irish Volunteers, so they were in fact fighting against the guys they had previously been allied with. So what kind of commemoration then do you think should happen, given what you've just told us? Well, if you look at World War II as a, as a sort of a comparison, we have instances where uh, allied countries, Britain, France, Ger um, America, now take part in commemorations alongside German representatives. That's a 70 years ago war. Okay. 100 years prior to that, we have the Rising. Um, I, I don't see why it's, it's not possible to have a British representative present at, at Rising commemorations. All right. L Liz uh, Gillis beside you. Liz, do you agree with what you heard from Neil there, that we should have the British there? Yeah. Um, Sorry, Liz, I thought you were, you were sitting beside <laughs> um, Neil, yes. I, personally, I wouldn't... Um, I have no problem with having a, a representative of the, the British government um, present, but I think where their role should be is in Mount Rome Cemetery, where the Sherrod Foresters were, are buried. They were killed in battle on Mount Street on the 26th of April. Those boys, and they were boys, they thought they were going over to uh, France. They weren't told they were coming to Dublin, and they were slaughtered on the streets, um, mainly by the orders of their commanding officers, but because they have not, they're not recognised as having fought in a foreign war, because we weren't regarded as a foreign country. There's no remembrance for them on, in November. Um, their names aren't on any plaques, memorials, because they aren't seen as having fought and died in a war. If the government do that, if the British and their representatives to Mount Rome, 26th of April, the day that he died, and with descendants of the families, those boys are finally being remembered and the government, by doing that, are recognising that this was actually a conflict between two foreign countries. They're but are you saying that, that that recognition should only happen at Mount Jerome and that it shouldn't be part of the wider celebration or it commemoration? It should be in, maybe in its own right on the 26th of April, the day that those boys died. And at least their families would get that recognition that their loved ones but actually died in the of conflict. But outside of that, outside of that, what should happen? Um, I think that would be a nice way to remember. And them. that's it, draw a line under that? Well, the other way is, if you have representatives of the British royal family, say, at the main events on Easter Sunday, the city's going to go into lockdown, and that's pretty much the way it will be. And the proclamation, as Trevor just said there, that was about the people, the citizens of Dublin, and the people of Ireland. Okay, and so they this won't should be, able to commemorate. Essentially, what you're saying, this should be this should be about the people of Ireland here. Oh, definitely. Uh, Dave definitely. Kenny's beside you. Dave, you had ancestors directly involved in this. What's your view? Um, well, just to tell you who they were, uh, my granddad was Maureen e. Hewley, and she led uh, Coming Among and Jacobs. And my great granddad published the war news for Pierce and uh, delivered a farewell letter. And on the other side, uh, my grandmother lost her fiance. He was a pacifist and he was actually walking the streets. So there's a lot of kind of uh, different views there. Uh, I absolutely am totally 100% opposed to the notion of commemorating the British fallen in, you know, in 1916 and right up to, to 1922. Why? Tell us why. Well, uh, for a very simple reason, really. I, I believe it will dilute. I come, I'm in my 40s. Like my generation grew up in the 70s and 80s when the IRA campaigned. Uh, was at its worst, the modern IRA campaign, and there was a conflation between what happened in 1916 and 22 and that particular campaign, and it meant that we were very ashamed of, of Pierce and McDonough, and, and, and wrongly, uh, these guys were total heroes as far as I'm concerned, and were ordinary people who did extraordinary things. I think including the British fallen in this will actually dilute their heroism, and it's time we reclaimed them for us as the Irish people. Uh, I also think, well, I, I don't just think I know as well, that. The, the British have never specifically commemorated the fall of this period themselves. Mm -hmm. As Liz pointed out, th this was not a war, the IRA was a murder gang. Let the British commemorate their own dead and leave us have our own. Okay, Patrick beside you there. Patrick, your so, father um, yes. was one of the volunteers, yes. also called Patrick. Do you yeah. agree with what Dave is saying? Very much. I think that uh, Easter week is what defines us as a nation and a people. 
what those people did at that time. They stood against empire and tried to establish for us our right to freedom, liberty, egalitarian, you'd like to say the French idea. But what about the uh, Irish people that Neil was telling us about who fought against these rebels? Well, Should we just erase those out no, of history? No, 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 no. I think that, that that is what's happened all along in our country. The truth of the matter is that we have to embrace all our history. All our history is important to us. So, and so you're saying let's, uh, let's remember them all? Very much we should remember them all, but we should celebrate the rising people. You, you can't uh, say that the people, I think the people who went and fought in the First World War were very deluded people. They were involved in a, a, a family squabble and they gave up their lives for empire and people fighting amongst them. And I don't understand what the First World War was about. Okay. I do understand what the rebel people were about. We'll come back to, to the to audience in a moment. I know lots of people want to get in, but I want to just talk to our, our panel. Eamon O'Keefe, if I come to you first, Patrick says that we should remember those people um, who fought and died on both sides. Maybe not commemorate them in the same way, but certainly remember all sides. What's your view? Well, I think we should always regret that violence was necessary. But to make an equivalence between the two causes, one where you are defending empire and another where you are uh, looking for freedom for a nation that had the right to freedom. But John uh, Bruton, is, who's sitting, John Bruton is sitting across from you here, says that it's about loss of life, you know, and that's, well, that's what we're looking at. Well, if you put that to an American, and you said to an American, you shouldn't celebrate the 4th of July, and you should have an equivalent in terms of the causes, I'm not talking about the individuals, the causes between those who fought for American freedom and those who opposed them, including Americans, in the Red Coat Army. I think most Americans would laugh at you and say that's an extraordinary hypothesis that any country would not celebrate its freedom, celebrate the proclamation. However, it is totally regrettable okay. that the British forced the situation that the only way of achieving that freedom was through a rising in 1916. Okay. I don't think the American model is a good one at all. Remember, one result of the Americans doing, as Eamon O'Keefe has said, was that a large number of people who had supported the wrong side in that war had to emigrate and leave America and they live in Canada and all over the world, and there are books written about that. I think we in this country should not repeat that mistake. We should remember that many of those who died in British Army uniforms were Irish. Gerard Nealon from Roscommon, Francis Brennan from Musher's Island, a long list of recognisably Irish names whose families are still living here in this that, country. That's a very they valid be, point, not, isn't it, not even something okay. alien. They're not, these are not, yeah. quotes, British. These are Irish people who were on, who are in, on the wrong side of a bullet. And, and I think well, we need to remember them all. Oh, sorry, I remember anybody who was killed in any war. And, you know, lots of people say that all deaths in wars are wrong. And we'd all agree with that. To say that the two causes were equivalent is, in my view, absolutely far But I go back to that phrase again. Unfortunately, Eamon, those Eamon, who I, there's a very important phrase that, that John Bruton used in his um, report earlier on, that there shouldn't be a hierarchy of victims. But there should be a hierarchy of causes. And what we're saying is the cause of Irish freedom is far superior than the cause of an empire who used, unfortunately, Irish people to protect that empire, uh, trying to stop the right of the Irish people to self-determination. So what I'm saying is totally different okay. are the causes. And can I say, can I say, if we cast our mind back to 1966, one very interesting occasion during those commemorations... The 50-year mark, yeah. ...was that Captain Hitson, who had been the arresting officer of de Valera, actually attended the Bowlands Mills commemoration with Eamon de Valera. And what is also interesting is he kept memorabilia that have now been offered for uh, an exhibition uh, all of his life on Eamon de Valera and he too recognised the justice of the cause that they were fighting okay, for, Aon. even though he was the officer commanding on the right. other side. Minister Aon and Reardon, you've got to solve this problem, you've got to square this circle because the government is, is publishing your plan tomorrow. I mean, what are you going to do? I think it's a judgment to, to commemorate everybody who, who died during that week. I don't think it should really challenge anybody to realise the numbers who died, the numbers of civilians who died, the 40 children who died. 
But, I think but do, you, do, you, do you treat each cause as equal? Well, I, I mean, think, for we, example, we can this see year, the divide here. This year is the 100th anniversary of, of Gallipoli, where 4,000 Irish people died there, including a relative of my own. 1,100 Dublin Fusiliers went over to Gallipoli and 11 came back. We look at next year. What we want to do is to examine not just those who died, but the motivations behind uh, the conflict at the time. And many people here in the audience have mentioned the proclamation, and they're absolutely correct to do so, because the people who signed that proclamation were people, if you want to analyse where they were coming from, were coming from a cultural sphere, a trade union sphere, they were dreamers, they were artists, they were poets, they were, they were academics. And what they were but actually you, doing was... Look, well, sorry, you, no, no, you haven't yeah. answered the question yet, because if we celebrate the proclamation, are we then ignoring the people know, who I went know. out in British uniforms with Irish no, names I, I, I've already said, uh, with respect, Claire, that we should absolutely acknowledge all those who died that week, no matter what uniforms they wore. I mean, it's well, what does acknowledge mean? So you, you does it mean celebrate? Does it mean commemorate? We are, we, the fundamental reason why we're commemorating 1916 is because it's a seminal moment in Irish history which effectively led to the republic we have today. So the very fact that the Irish state um, is commemorating 1916 is because we are giving validity, if you like, to what happened this, that, that week, to the motivations behind the proclamation. So there is a difference between the commemoration of the motivations behind uh, the, the rebels and the proclamation and all the rest of it. And a lot of what we'd be doing, and this is the answer to your question, in focusing on the proclamation and asking the school children of this country to maybe look at the proclamation and to compose a new one for the next hundred years, we are de facto given validity to what was in that proclamation, the, the, the radical nature of it, the aspirations in it, the values of it. Okay, so Mary Lou MacDonald, where does Sinn Féin stand in all of this? Well, I, I think it's fair to say on a human level that uh, a life lost is a life lost. Death is the great leveller. So irrespective of which side of a, an argument or a conflict you're on, I think as human persons, you can acknowledge that experience uh, for individuals. So you would want to commemorate those but people find, who fought against the rebels in order to win I, independence I find for this with, with the greatest of respect, I find this conversation slightly strange. Uh, and a, a very, very odd and bizarre position from which to actually consider in the first instance how we commemorate and mark uh, the centenary of the rising. But we've, I got mean, to, we've got to talk about it. Exactly. It is a reality, well, as we saw well, in John Bruton's report. If, if you don't, I, I have seen John's uh, report, but let me, let me just say this. The, the leaders of the rebellion uh, are regarded not as victims, they're regarded as heroes. They're regarded as people who weren't just dreamers and poets, although they were all of that language activists. Do you feminists, think they were heroes, John? But they Brayden? were. They were also. If you, if you, if I might, John, uh, Claire, John, they were well, also. You say people, there's no problem, and we shouldn't be talking about this. There is. This. No, Let's no, find out where no, the difference is. No, Do no, you think Claire, they were heroes? Claire, I, th I think they were very brave people. I think the rising was not necessary because Home Rule had already been conceded and would have come into effect and would have acted as a stepping stone to where we are today without the loss of life. Okay, so now I see where the problem is. My problem is without. W about killing. Sorry, and John, killing, if you don't killing mind. Killing people the, in this the, cause. The commemoration, we seem to have a fundamental uh, misunderstanding here. The commemoration of the rising and the proclamation is not a celebration of killing or a glorification of violence, as you seem to fear. It is about, as Trevor said, the proclamation. It's about a statement of nationhood, a statement of sovereignty, a statement of equality, a statement of social justice, a, sta a statement of civil and religious liberties. And far from needing a new proclamation, Aon, we, we have yet to implement and bear the fruit the point. of no, the, that, that's, that's of the point. existing proclamation. Point. In fact, as we speak in this studio the today, the proclamation remains a direct challenge to the status quo but in the here the and now see, in Ireland. See, in order, okay. That's the significance of it. And I suspect, do. if no, no, I might no. finish the point, I suspect that that is the reason why some would prefer to go and have a marginal argument no. No. Um, around a non-issue because I think all of us as human beings can recognise the loss that is death, okay. irrespective of what you Is there anybody else who thinks this is so I, I think it's a political diversion. Okay. No. No. I just, I just I want to get a response from our audience. These deaths Does anybody were the direct uh, result okay, of a might, political decision. All right. Of course. If I might, right. if I might, if I might just, just... All right, you respond and then we come to the audience. I think the last thing we need here is to have this turned into a political football. When I made the point about the new proclamation, 
It is very easy for us to send a proclamation to every school in the country for it to gather dust and for nobody to engage in it, to understand it, to read it and to, and to be inspired by it. What we're asking, and would be launched tomorrow, the idea of a proclamation for a new generation, is to ask the new generation of Irish people, not, let, let's not have this debate, you know, centred by historians and politicians. Let's ask a 12 or 13 year old, or even a younger person, to imagine a new Ireland for the next 100 years and inspired by the proclamation of which so you, you have spoken, can, can you, of which you have, which you have spoken, route. sorry, hold on, mm -hmm. of which you've already spoken, to engage with that proclamation, otherwise they won't, they won't necessarily, you know, it'll just be stuck in the wall, they won't see it, to engage with it and to take what's best from it and to make the, to, the commemorations relevant to them and where they are now, well, because I, that's the whole point of can it. Can I say is that I, I, I fully support the notion of school children and every citizen being involved. This isn't about a political bun fight, but can I also suggest to you that in addition to the school children engaging with the proclamation, I think the systems, the politicians, the political leaders, the political establishment of this state and beyond also need to Absolutely. engage with it. And bear in mind, we're going to celebrate 100 years and Ireland remains partitioned. That's a big challenge for all of us. Ireland okay. remains a deeply unequal society. That's a massive challenge for all of us. All right. And I don't think we should avoid those political realities. I want to come to the audience, Eamon, so yes, make your point and then we'll very, very get some briefly. points in. One of, I think, the biggest challenges in the proclamation is the enjoinder to do away with the differences that separated a minority from the majority in the past. And they are the unionists of Northern Ireland that are referred to specifically in the proclamation. And I think all of us have to work harder to work with the unionists in the North, which includes all of the unionist parties, to bring about the dream of an, of an Ireland where everybody believes our can future I, is shared Can together. I ask you, Eamon, because I, I think it's, it's very relevant to you, particularly tonight when one of your councillors has gone to renew in, in Carlo Kilkenny. How important is this for Fianna Fáil to take ownership of these commemorations? Oh, I don't think we're trying to take ownership of it. Uh, Do you think Sinn Féin are? And I think we, we've been very, very clear that we fully support the state commemorations. Now, in relation to Fianna Fáil, so many of the people who were involved in the founding of Fianna Fáil had been involved in the rising and in the war of independence, it would be ignoring the history of our own party to ignore our part, which is only a part of that history and not to commemorate it. And we're doing that in a tasteful and in a balanced and in a fair way. Are you and worried about, as you, as you look at this big commemoration coming up next year, and you, as you say, so many people from Fianna Fáil were involved, are you worried about the future of the party? Well, I, I, I'm worried about the future of the party, but I don't think that's tonight's debate. We can have that debate another uh, but night. But I suppose there. when but, you're, when you're but, looking ahead and when you're looking what, back... What all I can say to you is that I have lived my life based on the ideals of 1916 and of the leaders of 1916 in relation to working for people as a co-op manager, creating employment, promoting, as it would be well known, the Irish language, working with all of the different groups in Northern Ireland. They have very, very good friends amongst the unionist okay. community in Northern Ireland. Therefore, I have tried in my own little way to live out the dream of the proclamation that is the most extraordinary document because in a few sentences, it encapsulates okay. all, all right. that would be John, good. John Bruton, did you want to come back in there when we were talking about Fianna Fáil and its role in it and perhaps Fianna Fáil's future? No, I think this, this, I think all parties should take part in this. But people, it's important that we remember, when we commemorate a war, we remember the people who lost. Generally speaking, commemorations are designed by the victors to celebrate their victory. The fact is, in reality, the 1916 Rising was a civil war in this country in the sense that there were members of the Dublin Metropolitan Police, an unarmed force that were killed, members of the RIC, who joined the same, for the same reasons that people joined the Gardaí today. 16 of them, I think, were killed in the 1916 Rising. Uh, and many, many others. And as we go forward now to the commemoration of the War of Independence, it's important that we remember all the victims, the civilian okay. victims that were killed, because we should not celebrate death. Right. We, we should remember suggest, people okay. and, and we should yeah, honour their bizarre. sacrifice and not encourage a repetition of the use of violence. Okay, and um, we have lots of people in the audience who want to get in. A uh, gentleman there with your hand raised. Yes, go ahead, please. Yeah, uh, Tom Burke's my name. Um, uh, if you walk down uh, Northumberland Road, number 25 Northumberland Road, there's a memorial on the wall to Lieutenant Michael Malone, mm. uh, Oakland Heron. His brother was killed with the Dublin Fusiliers the year previous in May 1915. Eamon Cant, who is a signatory of the proclamation, 
uh, was killed in 1916. His brother died with the Dublin Fusiliers in April of the Battle of Arras 1917. Now, if I was the father of those two young lads, and I was asked by, some, by somebody who had some warped idea of, so, of, of political hierarchy as to where I should remember them, who I should remember best, whether it be once and over the other, I'd say your, 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 your moral compass is wrong. What we should, if, if I was, nobody has the monopoly on the tragedy of, of 1916, whether they died in France or whether they died in Easter week 1916 in, in Dublin. What, if I was the father of the, of the Malones or the Kian brothers, I'd say, for God's sake, do not let the death of my sons die in vain. Okay. Go and learn from them and, and work and reconcile your country from there. Okay, thanks, Tom. <laughs> behind you there. Sorry, this, I want to come to the man beside you first and then I'll come to you. man with the moustache there behind you. There should be a very simple memorial to remember the dead with all the names, just the names on it. And each, each vested interest group. And it's a great way for children to start. To start with a list of everybody who died. So remember everybody remember you're everybody. saying in the round. Just make it simple. Okay. And beside you again, yes? Yes, Claire. Well, there's one group that has been totally airbrushed from this historical narrative. And they are the 548 members of the Royal Irish Constabulary and the 14 members of the, Tot of the Dublin Metropolitan Police who were killed in those six years from 16 to 22. Now, for years, it wasn't fashionable or popular to, to commemorate the 200,000 Irishmen who wore British uniforms in World War I. But now, as you know, there are fabulous memorials erected in places like Dungarvan in County Waterford, in Wooden Bridge in County Wicklow. I saw John Bruton at that particular uh, memorial. And uh, the, I mean, the Germans, the French and the British have slotted each other for hundreds of years, and now they are all the best of buddies. But f sadly, many Irish people still love to wallow in ancient grievances. As Winston okay. Churchill said, we're still back at the dreary steeples of Tyrone and Fermanagh and the integrity of the ancient quarrel. Thank All you. Right. Mm -hmm. There's a lady in front of you there with a hand raised. Well, yes, I'd let, and Louise Mulhall is my name. And I'd like to talk about um, the women who were killed or who fought in, and fought and who may have um, worked, say, as, like Nurse Kyo in um, the South Dublin Union. She was killed in, the, in trying to protect her patients. And you have like, the like of Elizabeth O'Farrell, who um, so very bravely went out and gave the surrender to General So Lowe. more, more so, forgotten victims, you're saying. Yes, and, and the, the children that were, were killed as well. Absolutely. Like Chap uh, Miss Chaplin, the eight-year-old, who, was, ki who okay. was wounded in um, Stephen's Green. So we have to look at it from the women's point of okay, view Okay, Connor well. Mulva, where is Connor sitting? Connor, you're in the, in the front there. What's your view? I, I think what's clear from the audience and from the panel tonight is that there's a huge amount of emotion invested in the history of 100 years ago. And I would like to see that emotion converted into an enthusiasm for education rather than what we can only do with bones of the dead, which is to rattle them. Um, I think there's no point, and with all due respect to all relatives of all victims, the dead aren't going to come back, but there are very important debates and discourses that we can engage with within this period. Um, the other thing that I do want to engage with is John Bruton's point that the 1916 Rising was a violent rising. It was a violent rising, but I would argue, John, that I think the violence is slightly overplayed here because at the best estimate what we have is about 426 people who died during the week of Easter 1916. On the first day of the Battle of the Somme, counting British soldiers alone, 19,000 young men died. That's not counting casualties okay. and limbs lost and lives ruined. Okay, Connor. And it appears surrender because of the number of civilians who were killed. Right. It's in the John, surrender we have document. to look at this yeah. as an anti-conscription okay. rising because yeah. when okay, we do Connor, look at it through those lenses, we understand right. the motivations that brought people out in Eastern 1916. Okay. Do you want to respond to that, John? No, I, 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 I was very struck by the suggestion that was made a moment ago that but there should be a wall where all the names are put up permanently. And I think that, for example, in Glasnevin, and on the model of the, of the Garden of Remembrance or the National Day of Commemoration, that everybody who died, well, whatever side they were on, in 1916 and again in the 1919 to 23 period, okay. all of their names put, should be put up what there. Do you, what do you and all of the relatives of all of them should be invited to come along and see that we're reconciled now. All right, let's see. Well, what, I mean, what do you think I, of that, Mary I, I don't. I don't have an objection to that in principle. The, the bit that worries me, quite frankly, is that in the midst of this conversation that we actually miss the central point of what is going to happen next year. And it's not about rattling bones or it's not about glorying in the hurt or pain of, of, of another. It is very much about at this point in time, now in the, year 2000, in the year 2016, looking and saying, right, 
wh what of Ireland now? What of the Republic now? What mm. of the proclamation Absolutely. now? What country do we live in? What, what kind of country do we want to live in? Mm. That's the core issue because that is why but Aon the is women not, and Aon men, is not the women and men came out yeah. and actually staged the rebellion. It, it, right. it was on that basis. Can, can it was we? a political yeah. act. It was an, a, an act of political rebellion and defiance, okay. and I celebrate that I just defiance. Want to, all right, I want no, to ask you a question about, have you okay. made a decision about whether the British royals will be invited or not? Where are we at well, with that? I'm, I'm agreeing with the lady in the audience who, who feels that it probably would be, be a major distraction. I would prefer if we were mature enough to have British royals here and it wouldn't cause too much of, uh, of, of great so they're excitement. So they're not coming? But I, I, I think it would be too much of a distraction. Just make the point, the very first... Will that be announced tomorrow? Well, no, I think we have to focus on who, on who did, what who this commemoration is for. It's not British, for the British royal family, it's for us. It's for the Irish people. And it's, for, it's for the Irish people, as, mm. as has been quite rightly said. I make the point here that the first gentleman who spoke about who is going to be involved here. This is absolutely not going to be owned by government, by any political party, by even, even by relatives groups. It's actually for the entirety of the nation to take ownership of it because there will be a hundred workshops up and down the country after the launch tomorrow and there's going to be you know to be engagement in areas of the country that have uprisings that maybe we don't people really don't realize like in Scorty, like Galway, like Cork, right across the country and for people to, to bring out their own mm -hmm. artifacts from their own from their own families and to tell stories that maybe they haven't had a chance to tell up until recently because okay. as a gentleman here said about the reluctance to talk about British Army past and all the rest as most of us have in our background as I have a, a an Irish rebel pass and a British army pass. It's now time we can actually be open to discuss them more openly. Thank you. Eamon O'Keefe, you want to come back First in? of all, I think that the greatest desire of the people of 1916 was that the Irish and British people would be reconciled. And secondly, they were very strong in the fact that there shouldn't be sectarian warfare in the north. And in fact, Dennis McCullough came down before the rising and he met Connolly and Pierce. Now, Connolly knew the north well. And when they were talking about an All-Ireland rising, Connolly specifically said that there was to be no fighting in the northeast because it would wind up as a sectarian war. Okay. So I think we should be absolutely clear on that, that nobody wants to, uh, you know, in any way, encourage any kind of hatred. And in fact, the great dream of Ireland is that we could be friendly right. neighbours and the great dream of 1916. Aimed the second I thing is this, just on the very record, briefly. to talk about the British riots, I think what happened at the 90th commemoration was proportionate. In other words, the British military attaché from the embassy attended at the GPO, and I do think that that was a good signal. Okay, well, they're not coming. That's what we're hearing tonight. They're not coming. We actually asked our, our uh, Amoric Research RT panel, um, our poll, our survey of over a thousand people, and what they thought. Forty-four percent said they should come. Forty-four percent said they shouldn't come, and the rest didn't know. <laughs> so there you go. There are two people in the audience who've had their hands raised for the entire evening. I want to try and get to them. Trevor, the man beside you there. Um, we we'll just we just need to get a microphone to you, sir. Just bear with us for one second. Go ahead. I think the, the eight words from the proclamation, cherishing all the children of the nation equally, should guide us in, on this issue, but also in reshaping the whole of this island. And in that context, there are three facts we should honestly face. I can't. I've no time to take three but, factors. I'm sorry, really well, sorry. Okay, one, one simple fact. Seven people, for every seven killed that week, six were Irish, four were civilians, one was a rebel, one was an Irish man in police or military uniform. Only one came up from across the water. That's okay. a central reality we need to be honest about. All right. Um, unfortunately, I haven't a very little time left. Um, Mary Lou, just can I get a quick reaction to you from the news we hear tonight that the British Royals will not be invited here for the celebrations? Well, I, I thought that decision had already been taken uh, by government. I have to say when it was mooted originally, I thought it a very odd suggestion because um, this is in the first instance a celebration, a commemoration and a reflection that we as Irish people need to engage with. Um, and I think it would have been a, a bit odd, to say the least, to uh, prioritise having uh, British royals in attendance. It's much more important that citizens, that all of us get involved, and that it is a worthy and fitting tribute uh, to Easter week. OK. John Bruton, your reaction to that news tonight? I, I'm not surprised. It would have been a distraction. Obviously, the 1916 proclamation say that the people involved in the Rising were in alliance with the Hohenzollerns, with the German Empire, with the Turkish Empire and with the Austro-Hungarian Empire. So you could make a case for inviting descendants of those royal families. So I think it's probably better to have no royal families at all. Uh, no, no royal families at all. OK, all right, we need to leave it there. I'm so sorry, we've run out of time. We've lots of people who want to get involved, but I'm sure we will be coming back to it.